Is this just a step to reduce the ICP uh, in cases of uh, traumatic brain injury? Uh, I'd like to go through my experience, what I have found uh, in this uh, technique. You know, we all know that it is a big challenge to reduce the intracranial pressure in traumatic brain injury. And uh, we uh, regularly, we follow the medical management with all the medications, whatever we have, like mannitol, 3% saline, and then glycerol. And a very good ventilatory support is most important uh, in this aspect. But of course, then we deal, go to the uh, surgical procedures. Surgical procedures are most important because, you know, we need to uh, reduce the ICP and also uh, prevent the patients from going for uh, further neurological deficit. Now, uh, we do have these evacuations of uh, hematomas like EDH, subdural hematomas, ICH, and hemorrhagic contusions. However, the decompression of the concerned edematous cerebral and cerebellar hemispheres is wide. It needs to be wide and large, and we do the decompressive craniotomy and a huge large dural opening to reduce the intracranial pressure. But there is also one thing, one substance which we need to understand is that we need to CSF, release the CSF uh, from, from the compartment. These are the CSF release procedures. Um, there is a hydrocephalus, you know, some very regularly sometimes we do get hydrocephalus which can be, uh, uh, we, we can divert the hydrocephalus, but we have to understand that there is some locked, locked up series of in subarachnoid spaces by the subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, we all believe in Monroe Kelly doctrine where the CSF is displaced first when compared to anything else. So the CSF need to be displaced to provide the brain to expand. Now what are the uh, procedures which we have often seen is the surface sulcal subarachnoid opening. I call this as golf course holes. Uh, I do not know this. I've been doing for the past 20 years that whenever we see any, any, any brain swelling that I open the sulcal subarachnoid multiple layers. This I call it as golf course holes. Uh, and I do get it after some time I do find the brain start pulsating pretty well when I first start opening it. The second thing is that we open the sylvian cistern on top of the surface, the lateral sylvian cistern and slightly try to medially you start going to the medial aspect. However, now the basic, the, the basal thing is, can we approach the basal systems to, to take away the CSF? Well, that is what the most question comes. It is possible, but if you recollect in our neurosurgical practice, this is not a new procedure at all. It is absolutely not a new procedure because we all have gone through, when we do the CSF uh, fluid, uh, CSF uh, uh, rhinorrhea, we do the anterior cranial base, we take away and we go to the optic systems. This we know about the hydrodynamics. This is what we have been learning for the past 100 years, that CSF is circulated, CSF produced in the ventricles and drains into the superior sagittal sinus. This is the classic hypothesis. Now, there is something called the virco robin space, which has been described in 1851. However, we have not understand much about what happens to these capillaries, what happens to the arteries when pierced into the uh, brain substance. Along with that, there is a CSF is around and also the veins. So there is something is going on there. And that is where the research is going on and quite a bit of substance, you know, we, we are now getting more ideas about it by reading uh, many articles in this. So the CSF is produced in two ways. One is the classical way. The other one, the recently we start understanding, it goes and there is also CSF is produced everywhere in the CSF pathway. So this is called proto-lymphatic system. And, which we, and this is where the whole substance of the ICP is coming in traumatic brain injury. Now, this new working hypothesis is called the glymphatic pathway. Now, you can see here, uh, the, this is at the um, Virco Robbins space, where you have the artery and the veins, and then from there we do have the interstitial space. And you find that here, uh, the, the, the CSF gets down and then dispersed to the interstitial space, then drains out. So, so something is happening over there. You know, if you go through the research, uh, there are quite a bit of research has been done on this subject. Now go through this. Now we know that there are, uh, our understanding is there is a vasogenic edema when there is a trauma, vasogenic edema, brain-brain barrier is broken, uh, we get vasogenic and then cytotoxic. So both these things can produce the ICP. So what is the next one? The next one is 
there is some pressure which builds up because of the loculation of the CSF in the Virco robins. The elevated pressure gradient in cistern causes a decrease in the lymphatic, that is the lymphatic removal of the interstitial fluid, thus causing shift of fluid from cisterns into the extracellular space. Now this is the uh, concept. This is the concept which is now start thinking about it. Now we need to know whether it is practical or not. And this, this lymphatic, if it is obstructed, what happens is the fluid shifts into the uh, extracellular space and thus causing uh, severe brain edema. Now what happens? This is what, this is what I've given, a subarachnoid hemorrhage. It locks up the cisterns under pressure. And in the VRS, that is Virco Robbins, there is a perivascular CSF that goes into the interstitial space and cause extracellular edema. Now, for this only, we need to remove those CSF. Now for that, and you have the basal cisterns there, and then the liliquist membrane. The liliquist membrane is a barrier between the supratent and infratent. So if the CSF circulation need to be completely evacuated, we need to go through uh, a complete removal of the CSF. And this is the anatomy of liliquist membrane. You can see pretty well, this is a basic anatomy. We all know it pretty well, this is the liliquist membrane. There are two layers, one is mesencephalic and then there is a diencephalic where it connects between the supratentorial and the infratentorial compartment. Now this is a case report, so let's just go through the case reports. You can see here a patient with a GCS 5 by 15, severe edema, you can see pretty well on the uh, screen. And uh, this has been uh, decompressed, bifrontal decompressive craniotomy and cisternostomy on the first post-operative day. You find a very beautiful uh, decompressed brain. And there is a new watch here, and there is a lot of CSF has shifted to the subgalial space. A lot of CSF has shifted to the subgalial space. And this patient had a very long, uh, nearly it was, the uh, patient was uh, in about in one month in the post-operative period. Now, there's another case with a bifrontal uh, contusion with GCS 7 and 15. Now we can see on the second day, there's a massive uh, uh, hemorrhagic uh, uh, hemo contusion with hemorrhage. There was no pupillary sign, and this patient we took up like this. You can uh, see the video. You can see here. Uh, the clot is removed, and then after that, retracting the frontal lobes. And this is the optic nerve. You can see the optic nerve and the arachnoid is being teased out. It's a microsurgical skull-based technique. Now we are going into the interoptic cistern, interoptic uh, subarachnoid layers. You can see, and there you can see the pituitary stalk. You can see the very while while we see these things, you can see the CSF is slowly egressing out, and there are a lot of subarachnoid uh, fluid. It's just like a SAH we do for aneurysm surgery. We remove the uh, uh, subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage in aneurysm surgery and slowly and slowly you divert it and then we can come to the opticocarotid uh, cistern you can see here opticocarotid cistern here now we're opening up while we do all these procedures methodically meticulously like a skull based surgeon when you expose it for any tumor you can see the CSF uh, just egressing out you can see here carotid artery, optic nerve, microdiastasis, and this is the liliquist membrane. When you go through this window, you find the liliquist, or open the liliquist, and you find the basilar artery there. Now when we do this procedure, now we're opening the posterior fossa cisterns to the, uh, our uh, supratentorial cisterns. We do a very good saline irrigation, it's all microsurgical techniques, you can do it with high magnification. A nice saline wash, you know, to, to take away the subarachnoid to the maximum. And we revisit into inter, uh, interoptic, you can see here. You can see fight again and again, because I keep doing it. I keep on doing it for about uh, as much time as you like and until you find the brain is absolutely lax. And this is the stalk, and uh, you can see, here also you can get into the liliquist membrane. A very good uh, decompression can be achieved.
by the by the end of all this work you find the brain is quiet by end of all this the brain is pretty quiet uh, this you can see it and i'll show you it in very many of my cases now you can see here the this is post operative picture in this case i have put back the uh, bone flop put back the bone flop this is the post operative picture uh, this is the first post operative picture and then uh, we can see here there is another case uh, with the case 2 you can see that there is a shift in the csf into the subgallial spaces it it diverts it diverts the fluid absolutely now this is the latest case i did on december 14th there is a you can see the severe head injury um, this is the brain which was very very angry looking uh, then after removing the clot in the subfrontal region again we get into the left interoptic and right and you can see the both optic nerves and uh, this is the complete uh, exposure of the basal cisterns you can see the carotid artery you can see the chiasm uh, this is the uh, more focused view and now if you retract the internal carotid artery then you can see that there is a third nerve ica you can posterior clinoid here the posterior posterior here sorry here the posterior clinoid was seen uh, fractured um, seen fractured but however then you can see the lilicus membrane and uh, once you remove the lilicus membrane again you can see the basal artery now when 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 you keep doing this dissection meticulously you find the cs of keep coming out and now this is post immediate post of we place back the uh, bone flop now there is uh, another case here you can see here the sequence of events injury removal no bone bone flop cs of shift cis, uh, shift and there is a very nice decompression the same case you can see the sequence another case large one this is after surgery this patient we lost this patient as a primary injury and this is another case bifrontal craniotomy there's another case you can see gcs 15 and case and 45 days because of the primary injury there is a very good decompression done as another case there are injuries here but still we are able to maintain it very nicely good decompression this is another case you can see contusion ectomy basal cistern lastomy and discharge in 35 days now what happens is so the basal cistern lastomy does it drains the cs of instantaneously we all have to agree about it we have no nothing no choice we all know that the back shift of the cs from virco robin space thereby reducing the intraparent chemical pressure and thus prevent further interstitial fluid accumulation in the post so it prevents the second cascade of injury in head injuries that's most important so it gives an excellent drainage of csf and hence a lax brain during surgery there is a continuous csf shift which absorbed to the subgallial space even without a drain even with some surgeons are uh, preferring to put the drain craniotomy bone flop replacement is possible and that has not significantly affected the outcome satisfactory radiological uh, reduction in white matter edema is uh, observed in all our patients basal cisternotomy does not change the primary injury but definitely plays a role in reducing the secondary cascades of cerebral injury space occupying clots contusions need to be addressed along with cisternostomy definitely it is a superior to surface cisternal drainage as which i said the golf course holds and it may not be a standard stand alone treatment for brain edema at present a finish in 1 minute decompressive craniectomy alone may be questioned by surgeons themselves we all will be thinking about in few days to come basal cisternostomy needs sound knowledge and microsurgical skill to accomplish new concept of cs of formation and hydrodynamics should be considered seriously there is a landmark paper please read this paper this clarica this paper this paper is very very important uh, everyone should read this paper so that we can understand the technique better and and i know that dr ip is working very hard and propagating this technique but anyway uh this is uh, my point uh, which i experienced over a period of time with this technique thank you very much for your attention any comments please yes. uh, dr sumit uh, from aims new delhi 
wonderful talk, sir. Uh, just wanted to ask one question. Is there any threshold for the mass effect as seen on CT scans that you uh, decide to do uh, this sternostomy or you do it irrespective of the mass effect or uh, the intracranial pressure in all the cases? Because the cases which you showed in the CT scans, they did not have, appear to have much mass effect or edema because it is easier to do the cystinostomy while the brain is lax, vis-a-vis -vis doing a cranial, uh, this procedure in the brain, which bulges out on opening. Yeah, absolutely right. Because you know, um, uh, in, in my unit, in, in my place where we work, and we have certain uh, measures, we don't jump into all head injuries on day one. We do not, we do not, except in few cases. But majority we ventilate first, and then we take up the, on, the, on the next about 12 hours time after seeing a second repeat CT scans. That's why you can see the first CT and second CT, the admitting CT and second CT. Now, uh, the same point which I was thinking about, the last case which we did, we, it was a fresh case. Uh, we, we never bothered about whether it is a, uh, the, the, the amount of cerebral edema, but still you can reach it. You know, how we can reach it, that's very important. Maybe you may have to do a, a little bit of uh, subfrontal uh, uh, subfrontal excision of the white matter to reach the optic nerve. So that is the only point there. But the more the skull base you Means go... You have to reject the brain for that. Yeah, little bit. You don't, you don't need too much. That's what. Here, the, the skull base techniques which we are now doing it can be extended a little bit more down also. Uh, we may need not uh, retract so the brain. So in other effect, do you recommend doing a FTOZ procedure for a traumatic brain? That is brain? what. See, the whole idea is I'm just... We are trying to. We are trying... I'm, uh, you saw my, some of my patients, I put back the uh, cranial flop. Now, what does it mean? Because I opened it. Because I'm a regular neurosurgeon who have been doing the decompressive craniotomy. But now I started slightly rethinking whether I can. If there is no uh, ICH, if there is no contusion, if there is no EDS, if there is no, just cerebral edema. Can I just do a basal cystinostomy and get away with that? We have to wait and see. Thank you. Sir, you've replaced the bone flap and uh, the post-op scan you showed was probably 24 hours post-op. What about uh, edema developing later on, maybe about three or four days later, if you had shown that scan, because replacing the bone flap is a risk. Supposing there is a bulge, then the bone flap will elevate. So if you had shown that, uh, I think it would have been better. Yeah, definitely. I, I, can. I can. I can definitely do that because those cases which have replaced the bone flaps are very minimum, about four or four. Out of my 14 cases, about four cases or five cases, I've replaced it. Now, uh, if you can give me your email ID, I will send it back, all the, all the pictures. Because I'm pretty happy. I'm feeling a little bit comfortable. You know, we used to say that floating bone flops. You know, I'm slightly feeling comfortable. So I'm trying to understand, am I doing the right thing? Because it is a controversial topic. It's not a controversial topic. Probably we have not uh, ventured in doing this. The moment we start doing it, probably we will start understanding it. Yes, sir. Do you have any um, ICP data on the additional gain in reduction in ICP that you get from this technique? And is there any role for external ventricular drains in these patients? All right. Yeah. Thank you see, for your talk. Yeah, I see. Yeah, in external ventricular drains, this is, that, is the, that is the controversial point we are raising now. Mm. Uh, if you read the, 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 the research paper by Clarica, you find it, believe me, they say that whatever we believed for 100 years is not really correct, including the dandy study. That is including the dandy. So I, if you wanted to put the ventricle, unless the ventricle is seen blown up, it's very difficult first to enter into the ventricle, number one. Number two, or you can do it with the stereotactic placement. That's all. And I have done that. But when, when the ventricles are squashed in head injury, in, in the extracellular, we can't. So I'm, I'm not very, so we may have to reconsider our thoughts about uh, ventricular drains. And there are some people who advocate lumbar drains in these patients, what's your view yeah, on that? Yeah, that point I was thinking about, lumbar drain. Now we can drain the CSF, but not we'll take out the subarachnoid hemorrhages, mm. the lumbar drains. There is, there, is a, there is a good point which you are making it, I was just thinking, but what, what if we can have a patient with a diffuse cerebral edema, we just put a, a lumbar puncture and see what's happening in, a, in a very bad cases. We, those type of uh, trials we have not done and I don't have much it, idea. When we started doing decompressive craniacs, maybe we put a pressure monitor in 
you'd see the game when you remove the bone, you'd see the game when you open the dura. It would be very interesting to see the additional game with your, with your technique. Thank you very much. For your Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you close the dura? In the same lines, Pathivan, this nice paper. Uh, have you ever thought of combining this with ICP monitoring pre- and post-operatively? Absolutely. I, actually, this is what we have been talking in our unit. Uh, we have all the facilities. Uh, so I think uh, so far I have not done. The I've, results I've, will be like we, more strengthened. Absolutely. So I plan for two things. It's not only ICP monitor. We also plan to do some transcranial Doppler pre and post. Oh, we just thinking of. We just thinking of my resident is sitting there. We were just thinking about it because it is creating more interest. In fact, that when the more senior we go, you know, we get away from head injury patients. Uh, so the young generation uh, doctors are interested in seeing the head injury immediately. And they try to do, but we we plan for this. It's a good suggestion. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. One more thing: uh, like, Do you face any uh, CSF leakage from the wounds no. in these patients? No, no. Because a lot of CSF is seeping. I believe the me, they, they all get space. regressed. Okay. After some time, they get into the circulation. After the cranioplasty, if you put back the cranial bone, you find it is close because we always uh, patch it. We don't mm -hmm. leave the brain open. So after the dura is op open, then we put the patch, dura patch on dura top, patch. and that fixes it, yeah. Okay. Hey, Dr. Mishai. I think it has been answered. I wanted to know whether uh, you do the dural closer watertight. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no watertight. Uh, no watertight. Well, so I, uh, you achieve it by duroplasty? Yeah, ju just keep one duro, uh, duroplasty membrane over there, that's all. No, no not a very, uh, no. Because my idea is what, the idea is to let away the CSF from the circulation. Virko Robbins, uh, I mean, I'm talking about the uh, doctrine of Monroe Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you.